Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to this sixth webinar on open source verification. Um, I'm so pleased to see everybody here today. Uh, I'm always pleased to see uh, our brilliant speakers and our brilliant audience, but particularly in this case, we've had some technical issues and it felt a bit touch and go at various stages uh, over the morning. Um, so just to remind everybody, this event is being recorded and it will be broadcast on the SOAS YouTube channel at some point in the future. Uh, my name is Henrietta Wilson. I'm really pleased to be working with Dan Plesh and Alama Day Samuel on this project on open source verification and enormously grateful to them and our speakers and to everybody who's joined uh, the event today. So we have four absolutely brilliant speakers, uh, enormously grateful to them and to all the speakers that have joined in with this webinar series. Uh, today we're featuring Christina Variel from RUSI. Um, Avidio Serban from the Imperial College uh, Data Science Institute, Gary Somerville from RUSI's Project Sandstone, and Christian Trebert from the New York Times Visual Investigations Unit, and who's got a background in Bellingcat, who we featured in a previous webinar. Uh, and before I hand over to them, I'm going to just summarize some of the takeaways we've had from some of the previous webinars, as well as outline what's going to come up in this one. So as I said, this is the sixth in a series of webinars. Uh, the previous recordings are on the SOAS YouTube channel now, and it's actually the penultimate webinar. The, the next one is going to be the last one. And over the course of this series, we have featured about 26 different practitioners. So that's people who are actively engaged in open source research or are involved in analyzing some of its implications. Uh, so it's been hugely rich, hugely interesting, hugely wide. Nevertheless, we're aware that there's a lot more open source research happening all over the place. Uh, and it's really interesting to find out more uh, about that. Um, so just to remind everybody, by open source verification, we're talking about any monitoring that uses publicly available data or methods. So it spans a huge, diverse set of activities. Uh, I've noticed there are some commonalities that have emerged from these webinars so far. So, and I could, you know, I could go in any sort of direction with these, but when I was reflecting to, about today, it really feels about in recent uh, webinars, some of the really important findings have been the sense that context really matters. When people are monitoring activities around the world, it's not enough to think about, think in terms of a one size fits all approach. Different methods are appropriate in different settings. Different data is available in different settings. And once you have the data, ascribing meaning to it takes a huge amount of effort. Uh, as well, it feels as though embedded throughout this work, communities really matter. So there's, there's plenty of examples of individuals doing open source research. So I'm not saying it's impossible to do it as an individual, but what I'm saying is that we've we presented evidence of projects that are involving networks of people, uh, in, really discreetly in, in examples like ACLED, who are in the first webinar, or ACAPS. They have networks of local communities who are able to collect information in a different sort of way and who know the local terrain in a different, different sort of way. More than that, it feels like there's an appetite for more community building between people engaged in open source research so that's a really interesting idea for us at SOAS to think about and explore. As well through the different webinars, there's been this sense that open source research affords loads of possibilities, that the information, the findings that they generate can be used in a lot of different ways and are being used in a lot of different ways, but there are also limits to what it can do. There are limits in the sort of data that people can get. There are limits in what they can do with that data. Sometimes there's so much data, it's very hard uh, to make sense of it. And there's also a sense that however enhanced the visibility um, is uh, of uh, that new technologies afford, it's not infinite. There will always be possibilities of evasion. There will always be blind spots. So those are my takeaways. Uh, I'll be really interested to see if the speakers have anything to think about that, or if they extend my understanding in different ways, I'm sure they will. Um, so what's about to happen is that we're going to have four short talks 
uh, from our fantastic panel. Um, and I'll be monitoring the chat function throughout the session um, to uh, field any comments or any questions. So please do feel free to post your comments there. Um, uh, we'll be, um, I think not all the speakers can stay after three today, but we will be keeping the webinar space open until 3.30. So please, everybody feel free to stay if they can through that whole time. And that after three, we'll move to a more informal chat. So if people want to speak and turn their video on, that would be really interesting. Uh, it's about generating thoughts and conversations uh, uh, and exploring answers. Yeah. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Christina now to kick us off on her talk. Uh, Christina works for Rusi. Uh, I'm delighted that she's able to join us. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks firstly to, to Henrietta for inviting me to, to contribute to this series of webinars. Um, I've been following them when I can, and it's been a really interesting set of discussions across the, the event so far. Um, and your, your reflections actually tee up nicely what I was going to um, cover today in my remarks, a couple of uh, commonalities there, so it's, it's nice to see. Um, as I'm sure those of you who that have tuned into previous events in this series, um, are aware. We've, we've heard a lot about uh, open source intelligence and remote sensing capabilities in relation to um, nuclear weapons programs and missile programs uh, and how these might be applied to either better understand a, a, um, a proliferation activity or understand the options for verifying and monitoring those activities. Um, the project I'm speaking about today, it's part of a consortium project that involves RUSI, uh, VERTIC and the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies in, in the US, CNS. Um, the project is, is looking to undertake uh, an, a kind of a, an assessment and analysis of North Korea's nuclear weapons program um, by using advancements in remote sensing tools and techniques um, and building a picture to kind of analyze where, um, you know, where we see North Korea's uh, nuclear program uh, developing. Um, the idea is to then take the analysis from the open source and the remote sensing uh, inputs and plug that into a piece of commercial software that's often used to model civil nuclear reactors um, to help us better understand the, the flow of material through North Korea's nuclear fuel cycle um, to help us then better understand where there might be uh, particular nodes or choke points that would be interesting for um, maybe more creative verification opportunities. Um, I get the really fun part of this project um, actually, on that, I should say that I think Grant Christopher, um, who works for Vertic and I collaborate with on this project, um, is one of the consortium partners. I think he presented on the nuclear side uh, in a bit more detail, I think maybe in the first or second webinar. So definitely go back and check that out. Um, but where I plug into this project, um, I personally think I have the, the most interesting um, part because I get to look at how we can apply that methodology uh, to North Korea's uh, chemical weapons program. Um, I only half say sarcastically um, that I think it's the most interesting part because it is incredibly exciting and interesting. Um, and looking at how these tools and techniques apply to chemical weapons programs is actually um, quite under-researched and, and there's not much um, activity, at least publicly, um, looking at chemical weapons programs specifically. Obviously, there's some work done in relation to um, Syria uh, and chemical weapons use in Syria. But there hasn't been as much uh, kind of an undertaking to, or an effort to look at um, kind of the, the infrastructure and the programs in places like North Korea that might actually underpin a chemical weapons capability. Um, however, uh, the, the reason I only half say it sarcastically um, is because there's a reason that, that um, you know, these, these activities and these tools aren't necessarily applied to chemical weapons programs, um, you know, more broadly. Um, so, I think before I kind of dig into um, what it is we've been doing, I wanted to just lay out a couple of points um, that kind of over lay out sort of where we are um, in terms of why this is this is more challenging and why this necessarily hasn't been done as much in the chemical space. So I've kind of got four four things to, to just uh, briefly outline. Um, the first one is the fact that a lot of the um, capabilities that underpin chemical weapons programs um, often have dual uses. So many of the processes and the chemicals that are used in weapons production also have legitimate civilian uses. Um, so therefore, many of the processes look the same. So it's hard to discern between what's a, a military purpose and what's a, um, a civil purpose, a legitimate purpose, especially when we're talking about remote sensing capabilities. Uh, this actually directly relates to the, the second challenge. Um, and that's that many of the processes 
that are, that are needed to, um, to engage in these activities just aren't visible in the way that we might think about visibility in, in terms of a nuclear weapons um, complex or program. Um, so, you know, we, we could be looking for particular industrial facilities, um, but it's quite hard to discern what's going on inside those facilities or, or to know uh, what the intent of, of those activities are just by looking at a rooftop or um, a standard industrial building, for example. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of nondescript um, components of, of, a, of a chemical program, whether that's military or civil. Uh, in the North Korean context, this is uh, further complicated by the fact that North Korea deny any existence of a chemical weapons program. So any activities that are current or present um, will obviously be, be heavily concealed. Um, again, adding to that kind of uh, difficulty and challenge in what's visible and, and what we can see and know. The risk specifically, but it's probably applicable more broadly, um, is we don't actually know how active North Korea's chemical weapons program is. Um, we have guesses, we have estimates. Um, I am getting a little pop up that my internet state, internet connection is unstable, so I hope you can all still hear me. Um, I can see it, great. Um, so it's really hard to know whether or not a facility um, may have had a different purpose at a different time. Um, you know, North Korea's chemical industry really expanded in the, in the 60s and 70s, and the intent for the facilities that we see built then might have actually had a different purpose to what they do now. Um, and those changes may have occurred, well, the, the, intent, the changes in intent might have resulted in um, technical changes that just aren't observable uh, because they're taking place under, um, you know, under a building that we don't have access to. Um, it could also mean that actually the, um, the, the program has shrunk in size or no longer exists. So we're trying to prescribe an activity um, to a, an industrial base, that actually that activity just isn't there. We're, we're trying to prescribe something um, that doesn't exist. And, and that's, a, that's an incredibly difficult thing to try and, to try and figure out. Um, so this leads me to the kind of the, the fifth challenge. Um, and that, it raises questions around how confident we can actually be in using this approach um, or whether or not the, the error bars are too wide and there's too many unknowns to actually allow us to conclude that using tools and methodologies um, are, they have any value in a way that is actually just not heavily caveated and then we have to question whether or not that's, that's all. Um, so given all of those kind of uh, challenges and hurdles I've just laid out, um, you might be thinking, well, how on earth are you approaching this issue? Um, I should reiterate that this is a feasibility study. Um, and although we're getting some interesting engagement with the project, um, it's, you know, it's still possible that we might actually conclude that this approach doesn't have that much utility for mon monitoring and verification in relation to chemical weapons, um, especially in, in the North Korea case. I think it's also important before I go into a bit of detail about what we're doing, um, to just reiterate again that we're not looking for um, kind of a gotcha moment. We're not looking to pin a, an ongoing chemical weapons program on North Korea, um, but looking to explore what capabilities might underpin uh, a chemical weapons program or a chemical weapons capability in a kind of a, a creative and under-researched way, um, utilizing you know, the tools and approaches that, that have become available uh, through commercial means to first and foremost under, improve our understanding um, of the chemical weapons risk that might be present in North Korea um, and, then, and then go from there rather than you know trying to say okay well we can see that North Korea has x type of chemical facility and therefore it must have a, a chemical weapons capability as well. So it's very kind of exploratory um, and investigative rather than prescriptive. Um, however one of the things that a um, at least a large-scale military chemical program will need um, is a chemical industrial infrastructure. Um, again, this can be purely for the purposes of weapons production, uh, or it could also be purely for the purposes of civil chemical productions, uh, or both. Um, but because the um, obviously chemical industrial infrastructure can be quite large, this is where we've decided to start. Um, North Korea has multiple chemical industrial sites, um, especially for things like the production of agricultural goods and fertilizer, um, as long as alongside many other activities as well. Um, but because the chemical industry has such an important role um, in other areas of North Korea's domestic politics and economics, um, some of these chemical sites are actually quite visible. And um, they get talked about a lot, so state visits there, which results in ground imagery. Um, 
However, it does also mean that there's been lots of speculation around the activities at some of these sites. Um, and some of them, uh, a few of them have actually been recognized in open sources, both from governments and non-governmental researchers. But there is a risk of um, chemicals and processes that are relevant to chemical weapons production being present in North Korea. Um, but because many of these sites are different, um, they all have different chemicals present, different processes present, trying to think about um, applying remote sensing capabilities broadly across North Korea to all of these different sites um, is quite challenging. Um, it's still quite broad. So in order to narrow it down more specifically um, and kind of develop a, a test bed um, for applying these approaches, um, we've taken a case study approach. So we've started by looking at one particular complex, the Nam Hung Youth Chemical Complex. Um, there's a few reasons we, we've started this site. Um, it's large. Um, it's been a central part of North Korea's civil chemical industry since around the 1970s. Uh, it's still a very active site today. It gets lots of state media attention, as I mentioned, um, lots of visits from key personnel. Um, all three leaders have actually visited the site. This then results in on the ground imagery that gets published in state media um, alongside kind of more um, data driven information, production capacity estimates, that kind of thing. And that can all provide information that, that um, kind of we, can, we can assess and look at in, in relation to um, what's going on at this particular site. Um, so in looking at, looking at this site in particular, um, as Henrietta already alluded to, it's important for us to not just look at what we think is um, related or relevant for a military purpose or a chemical weapons purpose, but actually it's just as important to be able to make sure that we're um, thinking about the, the site as broad as we can, um, looking at all the activities, because in order to understand whether or not there is a risk of a chemical weapons capability present at this particular site, it's important to understand as much about the complex as possible um, because this will help us identify what we don't know, but it will also help us identify what we do know and whether or not, um, you know, understanding that that's, that doesn't have an importance for chemical weapons, it's just as important as finding something that might do, because it helps us rule things out. Um, so far, we've identified around 12 chemical processes and activities that uh, have been publicly acknowledged as being, as being present at this site, um, with having dual, dual use risks as well. So what, we're, what the next stage of this research um, is for us is to uh, take these activities, these chemical processes, and try to map them out in general terms. Um, so ignoring the North Korean context for a moment and trying to understand what needs to go, what inputs go into these processes and what outputs come out. Um, this then will help us kind of get a better understanding of um, how, how a site should be laid out or how a site might be laid out by being able to understand kind of the, the processes and the, um, the activities that are going on. Um, what we hope to do is to do this from a, a purely civilian perspective, um, as well as a, a military perspective, to try and see um, probably that there's a lot of similarity and overlap, um, but also pick up on subtle differences as well. Um, we'll also then try to work with people who have, have expertise in these sort of uh, processes, for example, in producing different types of fertilizer in civilian, uh, civilian um, industrial sites to help us understand what the activity might look like from the ground and then also what it might look like remotely. Um, for me, this is actually the, the most interesting part of the project because we get to draw on experiences and expertise of people who, like I said, for example, might have operated a fertilizer plant with processes that are similar to Nam Hung on paper. Um, it helps us contextualize the, um, the site we're looking at. Um, it helps us think about, you know, what practices should be in place. It's not necessarily just about um, machinery and equipment and, and the kind of the technical things that might be in place, but what other things might we um, might you expect to, to be taking place, whether that's things like security culture um, that you, you won't necessarily be able to get from remote sensing, but it can help you understand the kind of the broader context around a particular site. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're where we're going with this. Um, it also means that we get to draw on material and information that um, I personally wouldn't usually get to draw on looking at you know, nuclear programs and chemical programs. Um, and that's things like um, fertilizer, fertilizer needing capacity. So thinking about 
um, estimates, for example, that the World Food Programme might have as to how much chemical fertiliser North Korea actually needs. And then comparing and contrasting that with things like the size of the you know, fertiliser production plants in North Korea, um, we can do that based on you know, looking at how, how large a plant is, how active it might be, um, but also through the information that North Korea gives us about its production capacity, obviously taking that with a pinch of salt. Um, but we, that way we can gather all these different pieces of information um, that aren't necessarily directly related to um, or immediately obvious to understanding a chemical weapons program and help build this, um, this broader picture of what's going on. Um, so again, it's not looking to prescribe a particular chemical weapons activity to North Korea or looking for that gotcha moment to say, you know, North Korea is, is absolutely producing chemical weapons at the facility or it's not, but to try and help us walk through um, some of the pieces of information that are available um, that, uh, that might help us understand these activities and the utility of uh, monitoring and verification. I will stop there. Um, I think I could talk more about this project, but in the interest of time, I will, I will finish there. Uh, Christina, thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing uh, overview of a really complicated uh, set of tasks that you're doing. Um, uh, I was really interested um, by the, the insight you gave. This, this kind of mirrors ideas that I'm getting from other talks about how creative and innovative the open source research can be um, and that you're really exploring different ways of, of tackling a really complicated problem. Nevertheless, some of the difficulties you're encountering are fundamental to the verification and monitoring space and the dual use problem is, is key to that. Um, I could ask you lots of questions, but I'm actually going to move us on to the next speaker because not least because we started a bit late today and I, I don't want to to lose anybody uh, too quickly. So thank you, Christina. I'm going to move on now to a video Serban uh, from the Imperial College uh, Data Science Institute, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're going to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. And if that works, then we can actually Ooh. Uh, okay, apparently I, I can't share my screen. I'll see if I can do anything about that video. Um, uh, Let we me. just... Can we actually can you double check that you can share your screen? Just want to be sure that our co hosts have the right permissions. Sure. No, I think it's something with that? That, has, that has to do with my laptop. Oh, okay, I see. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's see now. Okay, I seem to be, be able to. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. that, uh, <laughs> That was the first problem. Okay, um, so I work in uh, machine learning and natural language processing. So this is a slightly different perspective from, from what you've seen uh, and probably uh, what you've seen in, in other talks. Um, and I currently work in the Data Science Institute where we uh, try to uh, process large uh, data sets. So on this particular project, I'm going to talk about uh, the potential of using uh, social media users as sensors um, to detect different kinds of events. And uh, yeah, uh, how can we process this in, in real time? And hopefully by the end of the talk, I will be able to convince you that uh, this is uh, actually possible. Um, so, everybody knows social media uh, and it's this large deluge of information. Um, and there are certain uh, platforms available, uh, some of which are uh, more popular. And the content is spread around in either text form or image or video or um, any other uh, mean that um, people uh, can imagine. Um, and we asked our, ourselves a very, very uh, early question in this project. Um, is this information actually useful? Uh, can we do anything uh, with it? And can we process it, it at scale, especially uh, within an academic uh, context? So 
in order to confer, confirm this theory, um, we um, started the project uh, on biosurveillance, where we try to detect symptoms of diseases and um, symptoms mentioned, as I said, by people on, on Twitter. Um, so the challenges that we had to overcome was to first uh, find out uh, what was the most appropriate vocabulary uh, to detect these uh, symptoms of diseases. Because as you probably imagine, uh, being in a very, very informal environment, uh, people are not going to use the medical terms to um, uh, describe their symptoms on, on social media. Um, we, are, we were particularly interested in using text primarily um, for, for this particular project, but I know of other projects who started using uh, image and video feeds as well, um, especially for security context. Um, and yeah, um, this is uh, something that uh, I think it's absolutely possible. Um, so in order to be able to do this at scale uh, and just to have a, an impression of the scale we're talking about, um, we were, uh, with, with Twitter, if you subscribe to their uh, public uh, free uh, feed that uh, it's given to you in real time, that's about 2 million uh, tweets um, per day in US alone. Um, so, um, and if you uh, want to have, and that's about 10%, so you will have to, in order to uh, process everything in real time, you'll have to have the capability of processing 20 million uh, tweets uh, in, in real time. Um, and it, no human being uh, is, or yeah, collection of human beings is able to do that at, scale, at this scale. So in order to, to do this uh, and to make this project possible, we decided to go uh, with machine learning. Uh, and this is something that I, I work on. Um, so taken the, the Twitter stream, uh, we are able to extract first the text uh, the timestamp of the tweet, uh, the unique identifier, and the location metadata. And this is fairly important because we want to uh, pinpoint this um, observations uh, on the ground um, for, uh, to, to find out if they are reliable or not. Um, because if you um, make an observation about an event happening in uh, Los Angeles and you are in, uh, on the other coast, it may be less relevant. Um, and then um, we extract the city and the country uh, from, from this metadata. Uh, and that's, I, I'm not going to go into much detail, but uh, the uh, Twitter uh, information is a bit convoluted. So we had to process that as well. And then we, we had to uh, do some natural language processing and also create a machine learning classifier to distinguish between the tweets that are uh, health related and also detect the symptoms uh, within the tweets. And when we looked at this, uh, originally people, uh, if you look at uh, work in, in marketing and uh, other types of social media analysis, uh, they, they look uh, primarily at hashtags and trend analysis to see how things are going. Um, but in, in our work, we decided to go beyond that. And we analyze the text, we analyze the context, because if you say, okay, I have a fever, uh, you may have, uh, and actually a symptom of a, of a disease, but you can have also a baby fever or a Bieber fever or uh, whatever. And, and this is um, something that is not related to a medical condition. Uh, and we have to filter that out. Okay, and, and then we, we have these daily counts uh, aggregated by state and symptom. Um, what we um, also want, uh, wanted to do very early on on this project in order to increase the confidence in the results is to compare these results um, with uh, news uh, sources. Uh, now, bear in mind that we are processing the Twitter uh, feed in real time as the tweets come in, uh, whereas the newspapers may uh, report something uh, about an incident on uh, a few days later. Yeah. And then uh, because we wanted to make forecasting and predictions about, uh, about uh, future events, um, we, we had to have, uh, to have uh, our gold standards and ground, uh, ground truth. Um, and then uh, we, we collected data from the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control uh, in the uh, US um, on uh, all the diseases that they are currently publishing statistics on. And this is on a weekly basis, uh, group by disease location and, and count. Now, there is a, a, a bit of latency uh, for, for publishing these results. And the reason why we decided to do this processing as well is that we, we realized that official data comes two or three uh, weeks later. 
for certain types of reports and for, for certain types of work, you would like to have results, even if they are noisy uh, and uh, biased, you would like to have some information and some sensing on the ground earlier than that. Whereas with Twitter, you can do that in real time. With CDC data and other uh, national healthcare statistics, you can't do that in real time, unfortunately. Um, so this is what we've, we've done. Um, now, because this project was primarily meant for uh, analysts um, that will uh, use this data stream and compare it with other uh, data streams, um, they will, uh, um, if they will find some, uh, some event uh, relevant, uh, they will send someone um, on the ground to investigate a bit more. So we have the uh, evolution of the event on, on the chart uh, on, on the top of the screen. Uh, the uh, part highlighted in orange is the current event. So the analyst may decide to um, investigate that particular event. Then uh, you have the uh, location uh, or yeah, some of the uh, places where, where these tweets are coming from. Uh, then on, on you have a collection of, of tweets uh, that um, we display. There are more, but and for, for this particular presentation, I had to crop the image. Uh, a word cloud, which um, may be interesting to uh, give you a, a, um, more confidence and a, an idea of what are people talking about uh, in, in this particular event. And then uh, we also compute the most relevant uh, tweets for, for this particular event. Okay, um, and now we can we can keep this data for for ourselves, um, and we can uh, publish it as an academic partner. But we what I also decided when I joined the Data Observatory at the Data Science Institute in at Imperial College London is to create a version of this data set that is available in the Data Observatory, um, and. This is a very, very social place where you can have large scale visualizations and you can discuss about your data sets and uh, your, your results. And literally in this particular project, you are surrounded by data. And what you see around you is the timeline um, of the data uh, that is, is available. Okay. And uh, we have different kinds of views. This is an intensity map uh, with all the events that we detected. And uh, yeah, brighter states are uh, states where um, more, more events are available. Um, and this is the timeline I was talking about. Um, and what I want you to realize about this timeline is that there are multiple events. Each event is color coded by their symptoms. And then you can see that some events are spreading over multiple days. Some are just half a day. Um, so yeah, as, as you will um, see uh, in any biosurveillance application. Um, and then you can go into more, more details. So what I'm showing here on the screen is one particular event, the evolution of that event. Um, then the orange area is the current event that the analyst may decide to investigate. And then when we uh, go into more details, uh, we can see a zoomed in uh, version of the previous slide uh, with the uh, timeline and the uh, event details. And then these are, um, these are a couple of tweets that we, we selected. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just to give you an, an, an idea uh, of uh, what kind of data we are, we are dealing it with. Um, and all the, all the scores that we see uh, on the screens are what we think uh, as uh, confident or what we describe as confidence score that uh, these tweets are, are um, relevant or, or not. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the data set I, I was working on and uh, to uh, move beyond this, we are uh, doing the same for political events uh, and also for uh, different type of uh, surveillance applications that um, can benefit from social media streams. Thank you, a video. <clears throat> really, really interesting. I don't know if you if you can hear, if you can pick up from uh, the. It's just started really, really raining, really heavily here. So I hope that's not interrupting. Uh, a video that couldn't be more topical, tracking disease in real time. I mean, you know, you must be watching events unfolding uh, and thinking a lot of things. Um, 
I, uh, like with Christian, I'm not going to ask you a question to yourself, but we've had a couple of questions via the chat function, and I want to give uh, each panellist a chance to respond to them, not least because I know some of you need to leave at three. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to invite you in turn in speaking order to reflect on these. If you've got no comments, that's fine. We can move quickly through them. But there are two uh, comments about uh, guarding against some of the threats that open source research might pose. Uh, the first question I have to scroll up was from Surya, thank you very much, um, saying, uh, is there a way that threats against so sovereign uh, states can be addressed? And, uh, uh, and then uh, Sarah Stanlick um, uh, moved beyond this and was considering threats uh, to individuals, if they can be identified by some of these resources, uh, but by some of these methods, sorry, how do we keep the people doing the work safe? Um, are there uh, any sort of codes of conduct that people are aware of that, that feed into this sort of work? Uh, so as I say, speakers, don't feel any pressure to answer if this is something that goes beyond what you've thought about. But Christina, do you have anything to comment on this? In the interest of time, I think there's others on the panel that are better placed to comment than I am. So I will keep my thoughts to myself on this Okay, one. thank you. A video, your turn. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. This is very uh, quick. Uh, Gary. Yeah. Sorry, I just got to unmute myself. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting question, particularly in terms of what the sort of subject matter that we have to deal with, uh, with, with Project Sandstone, um, in terms of what we need to go, in terms of, for us, when we look at, uh, say, the illicit shipping networks, um, which I'll be talking about um, after answering this question, we have to be so we have to be very sure in terms of who these individuals are, and we and and uh, in terms of, say, for example, the the the, the, own, the owners of the companies who happen to be sort of operating only these uh, ships in, in, uh, engaged in alleged illicit activity, and we have to. And for that, we're not exactly so when we don't say outright that these people are engaging in this activity, but their names are attached to these companies, which are attached to these ships that are in, that you know we know are and we are going ending up in say North Korean waters, for example. Though, um, but um, I agree that I think going forward uh, for this, it would be a good idea to um, for like the sort of an OSINT community to have a code of conduct in terms of how, what 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 we can do to try and protect the identities of people who you know, may not exactly be involved in, in, in these, uh, who may not necessarily be involved in these activities and may be misidentified, for example. Um, but uh, I don't think I've got really anything else to no, add to thank that. you. That's really, that's a really clear outline of the problem and, you know, feeling away towards a solution. So Christian, do you have anything to comment about these questions? Um, yeah, I'll add something to uh, to these to Sarah's uh, question because uh, the question on uh, on security challenges to sovereign states is obviously not something I'm involved with because I, I work for uh, for a newspaper. Um, but um, individual security, I mean, just one point, like just to give you an example. Yes, I think it's it's very important to be aware of this. Um, uh, just to give you one example, earlier this year, uh, Iran shot down a, a civilian airliner and. Uh, we were the first to, to, to break the news with visual evidence that they actually shut it down, which they were first denying. And um, basically, the key to showing a video that says like, hey, this video shows uh, this civilian airliner being shut down um, requires that we kind of explain how we verify the video. That we're not just showing a random video and accuse Iran of shooting an airliner, right? However, um, what we do is, as part of the verification process is geolocation, finding out exactly where the video was filmed, and chronolocation is basically based on uh, visual clues, uh, finding out what approximate time the video was filmed or around what, what date, right? So that you, you're sure that it's recent. However, you can imagine if you're published the exact location where a video was filmed from, this is evidence. This is before Iran admitted they shut it down. So if you publish at exact location, you may endanger the person that filmed the video because you're basically helping Iranian security services to like, okay, this is the house we need to visit, right? So this is a problem that we run into, I would say, every second time we are working with sensitive videos and it's not like a CCTV camera, but someone who filmed it. And I think it's it's really important to judge it from a case-to-case -case basis and um, 
uh, a group that has done great work on it is the Human Rights Center at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. So the Human Rights Center in, at Berkeley is, 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 is anyway doing really well uh, with open source investigations. And I would, um, I would suggest to, uh, to check their work out. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and that really echoes uh, comments that we've had from other participants involved in those very real political processes where people contributing the data can put themselves in harm's way if they're known to do so. So thank you very much. Um, we have got another question um, directed at Christina um, from Paul Schultz. So I'm going to invite Gary to give his talk, but Christina, if you want to be thinking about that, that would be great. Uh, uh, Gary's going to tell us more about his work at Project Sandstone. We are getting very tight for time, and I know that Gary and Christina need to leave quite pr promptly. So yes, thank you very much, Gary. Okay, excellent, right. So first off, let's share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Okay, can everyone see that? Excellent, right, so that's, right. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Gary Somerville. I work on Project Sandstone, uh, which you might have already heard before. Um, one of my colleague, uh, Joseph Byrne, was on one of these uh, webinars last month and that gave a pretty good overview of the work that he does on it. But I'm just gonna go over this briefly into what Project Sandstone is for those that um, didn't see that webinar. Um, so Project Sandstone is uh, an open source initiative that focuses on mapping, investigating North Korea's illicit networks. And our main objective is to generate open source data on the illicit sanctions evasion activity um, in, and, and, inform and the sort of the information that can be this submitted to the court of law and also to uh, build a capability for open source data streams that can be used in a variety of different scenarios. So, you know, we are looking at, say, specifically North Korean uh, sanctions busting activity but you know that can but from other stuff that can work on say like say what illicit wildlife traffic trafficking for example um and essentially we want to create um information that is uh that is actionable and that can be also submitted to a court of law if necessary so just to give a bit of background on dprk illicit shipping as many of you uh, already know is that the uh, north korea is already under uh, stringent un security council resolutions um, in response to its, uh, its nuclear missile ballistic missile tests um which also include like a lot of uh, sanctions against its um uh, exports as well including coal and iron ore which it generates a lot of revenue and a lot of that revenue is controlled by the military and a lot of that revenue then goes into funding the nuclear and ballistic missile tests um, why we focus on, say, the shipping aspects is that because, of course, you know, a lot of world trade is, is waterborne, uh, the vast majority of it. And so, you know, and it's not just North Korea that uses this uh, means of transportation to uh, conduct illicit activity, but also many other sort of uh, states and criminal organizations across the world. Um, you know, uh, based on our own research, we, we know that, of course, the stringent UN Security Council sanctions have made it far more difficult for uh, North Korea to get hold of uh, parts that would be used in, in for its WMD programs and ballistic missiles, but it does, it can still occur there. They are, take, they are of course, you know, uh, adapting to try to, um, to uh, get around the UN Security Council sanctions. Okay. So uh, for this program, we use a, a number of open source methods. Um, of course, Joseph has already talked about like the work that, that he does in, in the previous webinar, which I highly recommend um, that you watch as well, um, where it looks, takes a look, uses commercial satellite imagery um, to identify ships, um, usually in sort of the, the, the hot spots of where they, where they gather, say for example, uh, Nampo, Wonsan, Tongjin, and, uh, and then using AIS data then sort of um, is able to overlay that and track the ship and also using machine learning tools. How, and then on the other side of that, there's also the uh, network investigation as well. But like, so we're looking at, say, the companies that own these ships, and that is what I specialize in. To give a bit more context on that, um, I'm a Chinese, my background is in Chinese studies, um, so I'm a, China, I'm a China specialist first and foremost, and therefore my language skills are utilized every day to do the, to conduct these um, uh, further investigations into these networks, because a lot of them are, uh, located in China, Hong Kong and Taiwan. So I'm going to be going over a couple of those, a couple of the methods and techniques I use, some of the particular um, 
peculiarities of like say doing sort of open source research in Chinese language and using Chinese websites and also some of the challenges that that also poses for someone that's based on the other side of the world. Um, so first of all, looking at maritime data, because we need to know who the who owns these ships and there's a number of um, uh, resources that are available uh, open source. One of our preferred one is uh, a uh, paid for subscription um, uh, portal called um, uh, the IHS Market Maritime Portal, which provides a you know, wealth of information. And what we're looking for here, though, is, is in terms of as well as like sort of the general ship day, uh, information, but also who are the owners, operators, uh, the ship managers um, uh, behind the ship at the time when it was conducting the alleged illicit uh, activity. And, and from there, we can also then use that to then uh, look into the company as well. And from that, we can identify, uh, say, contact details, because what we're looking for here are identified. So either named individuals, the co their contact details, uh, information on the parent companies or subsidiaries, and also possibly any other ships that they, that company may have owned as well. Um, because sometimes, you know, they are the they, uh, lot of their sh ships in a fleet under a company will engage in illicit uh, activity, as we've seen. Um, in addition, there's also um, uh, the Tokyo MOU, uh, Port State Control as well, which is um, also quite useful, uh, in, it's in, it, which is also free to use um, and provides also similar information, but also um, records of whether a ship was, a um, particular ship was detained for an inspected or detained for you know, certain ship deficiencies such as safety. So for a lot of these companies like that are, for example, based in China, there's a number of where we start is we look at, say, the corporate databases in China. Now, there's the official one, the National Enterprise Credit Information Publicity System. But in my experience of using this, it's not uh, it, it can be temperamental if you're trying to access it from outside of China, where it will suddenly give you an error message and, and you get a lot of 404 errors. Um, however, there are plenty of uh, third-party websites which uh, which database a lot of the information from that the official uh, database and actually um, provide a, a better visualization of all that information which would have been gleaned from annual statements and putting it into um, something that's more, far more much more readable um, which in, and from here we can you know look at all sorts of information such as uh, the corporate officers their shareholders uh, the contact information of the company um, and their business scope, including um, historical uh, information as well, such as like when was the, you know, has the company changed addresses? Does it have any former names? Who were the former shareholders? Who were the former directors? And you need essentially need to collect all this information as best as you can. Now, of course, sometimes one of the, 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 the issues of sort of coming at this from the angle of say having, uh, say an English uh, name of a Chinese company, but they may not necessarily use that name openly if you do a Google search and in terms of the sort of number of Chinese characters, what it, what it could be, that name, it's very difficult. So usually one of the easiest ways to do that is then using, like, say, use uh, the, like, say, a, a, the address that they, they register, like, say, IHS market on, on those uh, on those maritime databases to then do a search and see which companies come up. And if any of those uh, Chinese company names match up with the English one, and then you've got your, um, and then you found the company that is that, that you were looking for. Um, in addition, uh, we don't just look in terms of in, in, into China as well. There's also a uh, similar database and registries available in Taiwan and Hong Kong as well. So Taiwan's uh, government, official government um, uh, registration um, system database works quite well, and you can use that to uh, easily find uh, Taiwanese companies uh, as well as Hong Kong's as well, which is also a paid for. It's free to register, but you have to pay for like say annual statements uh, if you want more information on that. Um, of course, the caveat being that if you're searching for these, uh, for the company names in Chinese for this, you need to be doing it in traditional, not simplified, otherwise you're going to get no results. Um, there's also an, an and on the uh, Hong Kong uh, corporate registry, one of the interesting things that you can sort of pick up in terms of the, the director of the company would have to put on the, and on their uh, annual statement, either a, a passport number or a China ID number. And the interesting thing about the China ID numbers um, is that they are that they do reveal certain bits of information about the individual, such as where they're addre where they're addressed to, uh, which as you can see at the bottom there, um, the address code, then followed by their date of birth, and then the order code, of which the last digit of the order code uh, indicates whether or not they're uh, male or female as well. So again, from that, just from that bit of information, you can sort of glean a bit more um, 
more identifiers of the individual that's sort of operating, uh, say, the company in Hong Kong, which, by the way, and, and I think uh, Dan Yulio in his um, presentation he did, uh, the last webinar he did here, where he alluded that the use of Hong Kong front companies, which there's there's a lot of, they, the, the, these illicit shipping networks, they make uh, heavy use of, of Hong Kong front companies. And um, one of the other platforms that we, we also use in Sandstone uh, is Ciari, which is a uh, data intelligence platform which is designed to assist um, the fight against financial crime and improve corporate transparency, particularly in uh, high risk locations. And so it provides essentially just gathers all this uh, sort of uh, information on corporate records, export records, property transactions, tax records, etc., and puts it into a much more easily searchable uh, database. And I mean, I mean, it's not something that you absolutely have to have, but it does make things so much easier, though, um, when when carrying out these uh, sort of, uh, investigations. Um, so from there, we have uh, a good idea in terms of who the uh, company is behind, who the companies are, the, all their other identifiers, and uh, the shareholders and the uh, corporate officers involved in it and there's a and this the, these sources that we use here are not exhaustive but these are some of our like main go-to sources that we, we use uh, from time to time so we make use of like um court rulings as well so uh some court rulings um, are made available online on, on a chinese uh government website um where you can search and then find information in terms of um the whether or not the, these individuals or this company has been involved in say lawsuits um which funny enough a lot of these um a lot of these uh, companies and individuals are um and when, but what it gives you an in, it gives you an insight into like say their business practices and also who they do business with um as well and and also identify other bits of information in terms of how they and how their um how they conduct their activities i mean say for example one company was sued by a lot of the crewmen of a ship simply because they didn't pay them. Um, Taiwan also, there's also a, a similar sort of database as well in Taiwan. Um, and also it, in addition, because not all the court rulings are made available on the this, this website, uh, the Chinese one, but you are able to sometimes on some of the Chinese um, uh, corporate databases are mentioned uh, in the previous slide and that, that, the, that information is sometimes available on that company's webpage. On, on that on that uh, corporate database um so in terms of other other tools we use there's also uh, particularly baidu maps um as well which is essentially baidu's version of google maps as you'd expect um which i prefer to use rather than, than google maps uh, for the simple fact that google maps does not always if you're searching for an address say in chinese it doesn't always come up with the, the it doesn't give you a, a, a pinpoint result um, and sometimes doing it in Baidu maps can you usually yield that result. And in addition as well, because you, those of those that use like say uh, Google Street View, um, Google Street View does not work in China. There's, there's no such thing. Um, but the Baidu does have an equivalent uh, called panoramic, um, which again can be, I mean, if, if we don't necessarily have to use it that much, but the option is, is there if you want to sort of get a good idea, an, an idea in terms of what is located at, at, that, at that particular address. Um, Gary, and, um, I'm afraid sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt you. This is all so uh, interesting and give, giving a really big sense of how your work involves collecting uh, painstaking <laughs> levels of information. And and this, going back to what I said earlier, actually, the sense of the context really matters. Now, it's it's three minutes to three, and I know you have to go. I, I, I can I can probably overrun a little bit. Um, well, and I, I just... know Christian uh, is, is maybe waiting to come oh, in, but if you'd like okay. to wrap up quickly, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. Apologies. Okay, and then, of course, use of social no, media. I apologise. It's great, yeah. Um, of course, use of social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, of course, you know, the, 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 they, they provide useful information, but not so much for mainland China because Facebook, of course, is banned and they have uh, Weibo and WeChat, which, of course, which are also very uh, difficult to um, access uh, from outside and also have certain risks because essentially they want to know exactly who you are if you're using Chinese social media. And that poses a, a risk to anyone that's doing this sort of work. Um, and of course, um, also quick searches on, say, other um, you know, just just on Chinese search engines, like you know, uh, using the other identifiers, maybe you know, the, the, someone's been posting up ads online and that where they're giving away more information, which um, could be again useful for us uh, going forward. Um, so, 
once so taking all this data then we need to sort of uh, database and map it map out the network so we use uh, there's network mapping software you can use we use multigo which is free to use but has certain limitations unless you pay money for uh, for the other stuff which does a customized what ontology to create entities um, and also makes it very uh, versatile in that way and allows you to visualize that data into graphs, which is um, very useful to understand all this data. Um, from that, what we're looking for is overlapping identifiers. So corporate offices, shareholders, do they own any other companies? Are they connected to anyone else? Contact details, do certain, some of these companies that are connected, of course, share contact details and as, as well as um, overlapping registered addresses or whether or not they're, you know, in sort of, a, whether some of these companies in these networks are located, like say, for example, in the same building. Then, of course, uh, there's cross-referencing that uh, data, uh, all, that, all that information as well with um, other illicit activity of sanctioned entities. So, you know, there's um, a number of places to look for the for this so panel of experts reports, UN designation list, the UN actual designations list, which is like what's published by OFAC or, or the EU, um, and as well as other open source reporting. Um, so just a quick... Um, Example here of, of the cross jurisdictional, uh, the, the, the importance of doing this uh, sort of uh, cross jurisdictional uh, mapping of networks. Um, as you see, they, they operate across many jurisdictions. Um, you can read this in our fourth report, which uh, where uh, Chinese companies are using um, UK register, uh, registered companies to own ships that were going to North Korea. Um, and same, another one here where you've got a Taiwanese based uh, company that's uh, that had a registered Hong Kong company that connected to another sh uh, ship which had been doing illicit activity um, and going into North Korea uh, as well. Um, and another technique we also use as well as a timeline analysis um, where we're looking for here for overlapping events and patterns of behavior as well. Um, so um, we, we, you can you can do this on Excel, but it's usually just a, we we have a bit of software which uh, which we use called Precedent, which allows us to better visualize it and we can make more sense of it. Um, and yeah, so I mean, from this we can also sort of uh, understand patterns of behavior, such as a recent report uh, on the north on the North Korean ships that were sort of in Chinese waters that we published earlier this year, is that we were seeing an overlap of like say certain uh, Hong Kong front companies that were being registered in uh, at around the same time as each other um, for, uh, to operate different ships and even though sh these ships are also showing similar patterns of behavior and movements to one another that suggests that there was um that the that they they are being centrally coordinated um so just briefly outline some of the challenges that we do face though in this as well as that some because of we're, where we're based um it's very difficult to access certain uh, sources in, in in china uh such as the some of the full database or paid databases which is not possible um, as I mentioned earlier, there's also the problems of getting access to Chinese social media, particularly now. Um, and one of the other interesting uh, things we found out as well with the use of the Hong Kong front companies was that they've been, that they've, before where a, a, a known Chinese individual that is linked to, say, a company in, 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 uh, in China, um, is registered himself as the director of the shareholder in a Hong Kong front company. However, what we're finding now is that a lot of these Hong Kong front companies operating these um, ships that are alleged to be involved in illicit activity are not. Um, the, the individual is is the correspondence address they use is in like the, in some remote village somewhere. And what we suspect is that they're using um, the, uh, the, the they're somehow someone's getting hold of their, the IDs of these people and using them to register the companies and they can't be traced back to them from open sources. And this is one of the, um, and I mean, in terms of how they get, how they get hold of the IDs, we, we can only, um, we can only, we can only guess, but um, I'm sure you can use your imagination. Um, but yeah, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, sorry about having to uh, rush through it. No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Gary. Really, really interesting. And you're right. It followed on very nicely from Daniel Yu's, uh, presentation at the last webinar giving this sense of, of piecing together different bits of the jigsaw thank you now I know you might need to leave so I'm going to say goodbye to you and thank you very much and I know Christina has already left so uh, thank you to her as well and Paul I'm going to respond uh, with some comments to you from her but now I'm going to hand over to Christian Trebert thank you very much for waiting uh, Christian's from the New York Times Visual Investigations Unit and has a background with Bellingcat uh, uh, amongst lots of other things uh, so thank you, Christian. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll keep it very brief uh, because we're already way over time. So I'll just keep it like 
Uh, I'll just do a very brief case study. Um, let me see. We'd love to hear anything you've got to say. Please don't really have to rush. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> um, you can you can hear me and see my screen. I think right. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. Um, let me just see if I can remove your faces somehow. Not sure how. Um, smaller. This should work. Uh, okay. So yeah. Um, uh, I work at the, the New York Times uh, Visual Investigations Unit, which is basically a new uh, form of, of accountability and uh, investigative journalism uh, being pioneered at the time. So basically combining traditional reporting with um, more uh, in-depth way of digital investigation. So I think of open source investigations uh, using satellite imagery. We've, we've heard it from the three different speakers, uh, basically uh, company records, ship trackers, you name it, right? We use it um, um, to investigate. Um, so the team is now, um, we have around 15 to 20 people that includes like editors and senior producers and so on. We mostly produce uh, video formats um, and it's mostly focused, well, a lot of it is internationally, but more recently we also focus a lot on, on, on US domestic issues. Uh, on the top right here, we see the, the shooting in Las Vegas, uh, which is obviously already a while ago, um, but we focus a lot on police brutality as well. Um, in the top uh, bottom left corner, you can see that. And just to give you a bit of a sense of the the the, uh, the variety of, of investigations we do, um, I mean, it's 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 police brutality in Hong Kong. It's 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 Venezuela. It's it's uh, the murder of uh, Khashoggi in in Turkey. Um, it's the NYPD in New York, the city where I live. Um, a black driver, marijuana boss, and a body camera that turned off. Um, and it seems that an NYPD officer is planting evidence in the car. Um, this one, one bomb, 11 children killed, and evidence implicates US. I will talk about it in a second because their open source uh, arms tracking uh, was vital, was actually the story. The story was built around open source um, arms tracking. Um, an Israeli soldier killed a medic in Gaza. We investigated the fatal shot. Um, this is very similar to what Gary talked about, actually, how Kim Jong-un smuggled luxury Mercedes to North Korea. So in case you want to see uh, a very complicated investigation with company records, satellite imagery, AIS data uh, combined in a five-minute video, um, this is one of the very few videos of us that actually kind of more a less heavy subject. I mean, it's still uh, about smuggling, but um, it's it's just about Kim Jong-un's luxury cars, which is like a slightly lighter subject than most of the stuff we focus on. Um, uh, how George Floyd was killed in police custody. We, we, we basically um, tracked the whole uh, incident second by second. Um, and uh, this, this one won a Pulitzer, was part of, of, of a body of work that won a Pulitzer this year. Um, Russia bombed for Syrian hospitals. Uh, we have proof. Basically, we obtained thousands of um, uh, Air Force recordings, uh, and and we basically analyzed them to investigate the Russian Air Force in Syria. Um, basically, our modus operandi is like we something happens, and we 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 collect and analyze evidence. Right? Use these are videos. Think of scanner audio. Think of photos, witness testimonies. You name it, and basically, we try to get as much information as possible so what we're seeing here this is this is the kill uh, the, the the palestinian medic that was killed in gaza and basically it's second by second because there's so many people with mobile phones right you just try to put them all on a timeline um another thing is like verifying the visuals right this is a process we call geolocation so on the left we have the source image and on the right we have a reference image which is a satellite image in this case and we try to link the visual features that we see in the source image to a satellite image, for example, or another uh, image from a ground perspective, for example, to make sure that it's from the same location. Um, ship and plane trackers. Um, this is an investigation into Italian bombs being shipped to um, Saudi Arabia and then eventually being used in, um, in, in Yemen. Um, if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. It's, 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 it, it explains the methodology. Um, it's in a video format. Um, we use uh, 3D reconstructions as well. 
uh, often working with the group uh, Forensic Architecture based at the Goldsmiths University in London. Um, this is in, in orange is the Palestinian medic that was killed that I talked about earlier. Um, and basically it's, it's every other individual that was around her just to make sure that we have an entirely clear view of what was going on when the fatal shot was fired. And um, obviously what we're here for, um, identifying weapons is, is, is a big part uh, of, uh, of open source investigations. Um, I, I mentioned, or, or, or Henrietta mentioned that I, I, I used to be part of the group called Bellingcat. Um, and definitely check out the work of Bellingcat and definitely we can, we can do it after the questions. But um, I mean, I myself come from the kind of Twitter niche network, right? I had worked on the ground in places like Iraq and, and Syria, um, um, but um, what really brought me to, to a newspaper like the New York Times is literally online investigation, literally investigating weapons and uh, tweeting about it. So uh, the community around Bellingcat is, 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 is very um, encouraging. Um, um, there, is, there, there are a lot of people there that, that move on to other places, but also just the fact that um, um, so much can be done online. This is by no means to say that on the ground research is not important, right? By no means. But sometimes you don't, you do not have access to the area, and the only way to get a sense of what's going on is by open source investigation. And in this case, because Henry specifically asked to talk about arms tracking, um, obviously because of the project, it's, 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 it's arm, arms identification as well. So I wanted to show you this case study um, about Afghanistan, um, one bomb, 11 children killed and the evidence that implicates the US. Um, so um, this was an instance where, um, I mean, it's Afghanistan, there's a lot of things going on, um, but there was an alleged airstrike on a family home in the uh, in Wardak um, uh, a, a province in, in in Afghanistan, and um, what we usually do when we get material like this, right? It's, it's it's you just look over it a few times. You can see people going through um, what appears to be the aftermath of some kind of explosion, right? They claim it's an airstrike. Um, um, they claim it's it's the U.S. and um, the claim here was that um, 11 children were killed. So there was a family living here and um, their cousins were staying with them as well. Um, and there was only one survivor, which was the father, um, because he was working um, in Iran and was not home at the time. So we have allegedly 12 people killed. Uh, 11 of them being children. So I'm not going to show you the pictures, but just to give you some background, right? Like we also have pictures of the bodies that were recovered. And um, we had some pictures of the kids as well while they were still alive. So this is a gruesome process to, um, to um, basically um, compare their faces and features to make sure that we're uh, highly likely looking at the same kids. But once we establish there some kind of uh, level of confidence to say, okay, hey, this really seems that um, a lot of children died in this strike uh, as well as a woman. Um, um, it's like, okay, let's, let's take a further look at this strike. Um, now, the father who survived the strike, he already um, seeked answers, right? Like who is responsible for this attack, um, which was suspected aerial airstrike, uh, an airstrike. Um, but there were very little answers for him. So we teamed up the, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is also based in London. Um, and we decided to investigate this airstrike ourselves specifically because in um, October, sorry, in October, 2018, um, the Pentagon told us that they found no connections between directions and the claims of non-combatant casualties, which were these um, 11 children and uh, the mother, right? The 12 casualties in total. So they basically said in October 2018, we, didn't, we don't find any connections, right? And later on, they would go even further um, when we asked about it again, like we do not even have a record of an airstrike being conducted 
on September 23, 2018 in the Yichtu district, Water province. So what we did is like, okay, this is interesting because we have a flat out denial from the Pentagon that they would be, um, that they would be uh, striking, uh, that they even conducted an airstrike in this region. So we thought, okay, we clearly see that this house is damaged. We do see that indeed um, casualties, uh, they were living here, they, 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 we know they died. Um, so what is going on here, right? So a very important thing is that we always try to, uh, like what I said, the geolocation, right? So we had this photo of the house um, and we try to map it out. Now, an interesting aspect is for anyone who is focused here on uh, Palestine, on Iraq or Afghanistan, is that, for example, if you use Google Maps, you won't get the best satellite imagery because um, it's either uh, downgraded in quality or it's, um, it's, 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 it's very outdated, right? So you need to find other sources for satellite imagery. Uh, you can fill in the reasons, uh, I mean, you know, why it are those areas where there is not high res satellite imagery uh, publicly available most of the time. But um, it's, um, we were able to find the exact location. Um, and an important part to think, uh, to, to say is that we knew um, that a raid was going on in the village that time. So the Taliban, there's a Taliban prison here where Afghan soldiers were being uh, held captive. And Masi's house, the father, the family was staying here. And we indeed could see with before and after satellite imagery that the house was um, um, bombed between the time frame that he said it was on the 23rd of September. So there was another uh, part. But then we come to the most important part, which is like, when um, either online photos or images appear and um, these are alleged weapon fragments, um, it's obviously very important to make sure that you are uh, sure that, that these photos or the fragments were indeed found at location and had brought in from somewhere else. Um, but once you know, you can really distill a lot of interesting clues, usually from the weapon fragments, right? So in this case, um, there were this pattern of four bolts, which you can see here. And um, we have, uh, we can see them here as well on a different part. And we talked with uh, weapons experts um, inside and outside of the New York Times that said, basic, basically, these are the steering fins, the tail fins, of a GDEM uh, a guiding spot for an, a usually unguided bomb. So a GDEM basically makes an unguided bomb a guided bomb. And the thing is, this is very important because um, by talking with a variety of experts, uh, as I said, outside and inside the, uh, the New York Times, as well as from our own experience, we know, okay, this is a very clear indication that this is GDEM uh, munition was used, guided munition was used. Now, there was another uh, fragment which we found, which had a, um, uh, a number uh, or characters on it, which led back to a, a US company, Woodward. Um, so we had those two fragments, besides other fragments, that were really keen investigation for us to believe, okay, a guided munition was used or an, a bomb with a GDEM uh, 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 which, ma which makes it guided uh, was used. And this was such an important uh, part because for us it was like, okay, we know these fragments are from the location, but the US is flat out denying that they conduct this airstrike, which is interesting because we are thinking like, hey, are there maybe other air forces active above Afghanistan that could have launched this strike? Now, the thing is, basically, only the Afghan Air Force and the United States Air Force are conducting airstrikes above Afghanistan, specifically the water province in Afghanistan. So we know for a fact that the Afghan Air Force at the time was not capable of carrying GDEM munitions. So that left us basically, it was very simple, left us, it must be the US. So what we did is we are like, okay, either we don't know what's going on, but the US is denying a strike that we have evidence for that, that it was clearly them that conducted it. So what we did is we provided them with the exact coordinates of the house, of the approximate time, the day, and these munitions, um, basically saying it, it, it cannot be any other way. 
exactly than it was. We confronted them with this evidence and then um, they got back to us and they completely changed their story and said, after review, it's our assessment that only combatants were killed. Now we can go for an hour, hours, hours, and hours in discussion how the Pentagon reviews um, civilian uh, casualties. Uh, I won't do that right. Say a week later that uh, the building was stuck in self-defense because um, there was a raid going on on this Taliban prison and they said there was firing coming from um, uh, the house where they were staying. Now, we, we weren't able to confirm this, um, but this is just a very small example to show um, how important, um, um, even if you cannot visit the location, we weren't able to visit the location because it's under Taliban control, um, how you can still make, uh, you can still investigate incidents without being on site. And I think, um, yeah, um, this is a very small example, but um, yeah, please check out the work of, 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 the, of the New York Times which is investigations team if you're interested to see, of learning more, um, but also definitely check out Bellingcat and other, um, or the uh, um, uh, online arms investigators. There's a guy called Calibra Obscura. Um, you have Abraxa Spa. There's all these like guys on Twitter that uh, that are uh, that are really good at arms tracking. Um, for those, I saw there were some questions about um, uh, the OPCW and so on. Um, make sure to check out our investigation into the chemical attack on uh, on Duma as well. Which, which, which includes um, all of the stuff I talked about uh, before as well, but also shows some of the limitations. I guess I should stop because um, it's uh, late. Amazing. What an amazing uh, talk to kind of incorporate all sorts of things uh, that have been mentioned. Thank you very, very much. Uh, really interesting and uh, amazing to see uh, those visuals as well. I was really struck, Christian, that your, your project is has the potential to be truly global. You're looking at uh, what's happening in New York as well as what's happening overseas, uh, which is which is very interesting. Um, as you pointed out, uh, Paul Schultz has posted a question that he directed at, at Christina Varela, but I think it has kind of broader uh, significance, uh, although you, you may disagree with me. Um, so Paul's question to Christina was, uh, how could open source be conclusion, how, sorry, how could open source conclusions be integrated into uh, OPCW and UN action. So regimes at the international level that are set up to deal with international problems, is there a way that results could be fed into those sorts of processes, bearing in mind that uh, uh, all sorts of information is challenged uh, by various states parties? Paul, I can see you've appeared. Do you want to talk for yourself? And, and I wondered, I was going to put it to both Christian and the video because I recognise that your uh, research might not be aiming to impact on political processes, but I wondered if you considered, I mean, clearly, Christian, you, you have considered how to hold a government to account, but if there's, if there's wider considerations about how to feed into bigger international processes. So I'll start with Paul and then okay. take the speakers in turn. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, we know how much the Russian and I think the Chinese governments do not like billing cat and associated activities. And they are going to be able to say um, that almost everything you produce can be synthesized. Uh, so they will be questioning uh, just the sheer, the sheer replicability and provability of, of the sort of information that, that, that you deal in. Now, of course, it's useful for um, early warning. It's useful for sanctions. Um, it's useful sometimes for... For, for bombing places, uh, which is one of the reasons I don't like it. But um, how usable is it going to be uh, for politically and legally mandated process, which processes which are subject to Security Council veto or, or even OPCW um, uh, Council veto? That, that, that's my worry. That we, the world's getting very good at looking at stuff and using its comp the compound eyes of humanity, but much of what it w is being revealed will not want to be seen and will be, uh, will be ruled out as unacceptable by very powerful international actors. And, th and that's a recurrent problem for a number of the uh, subjects of, of, of these seminars. What is to be done about that? So I'm going to, uh, thank you, Paul. I'm going to link that and I'm going to ask 
the video first uh, uh, and, you know, I'll just bounce it back if you want to. But I'm going to link it to the question that Paul gave to a video about how easy it is to spoof uh, the, the data you have. And you already said it's very easy and that's, you know, that's why you, you recognise that. But my reflection for what it's worth is that the, the sorts of work that a lot of open source researchers are doing is not looking for that one piece of evidence. It's about combining multiple yeah. pieces of evidence. So in that case, a video's, your, your work could be really feeding into different processes, but uh, what, what have you got any comments for Paul or this wider political question? Yeah, so I, I always seen uh, my, my work as an early warning uh, signal uh, and not the only signal that can confirm or deny the presence of an event. Um, so even uh, in, in biosurveillance, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the system that we've uh, been uh, designing and we've been building uh, was only meant to be uh, one of the data sources. And then the analyst would uh, compare these signals with something else they will have. Um, they will compare this with uh, newspapers and other data sources they, they uh, have access to. Um, and uh, they will, uh, yeah, confirm if it's something that is worth investigating uh, deeper. Um, now, re related to spoofing and data distortions, uh, I know that when, when you are dealing with automated systems, and uh, specifically with machine learning, this is very, very, uh, a very, very, um, yeah, um, good balance to have uh, to to have cleaner data that you can rely upon and then have noisier data that you you need to confirm um, with with spoofing i've been working uh on on spoofing applications and spoofing detection on on uh, cryptocurrency uh more recently because that's very very prone to spoofing um, and then uh, the same principle can be applied to social media analysis and also uh, more recently for coronavirus, uh, we've been looking in more, uh, I can't call them cleaner data sources, but more aggregated data uh, rather than uh, individual tweets that I, I described in, in this project. Um, and then, yeah, when, when you aggregate more data and um, you have data from multiple sources, then you increase the confidence in, in the data that you're, you're dealing with. So, yeah. Uh Great, thank you very much, video. That's very clear. And uh, I'm going to hand straight over to Christian because I know he has to go pretty soon. Uh, so thank you, Christian. If you want to comment, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a good question, but I don't think I'm really in a position to say anything about it, right? Because it's my job, like as a journalist, to to find out the facts, um, and basically that's what we're doing, right? So bigger questions as to like, does it feed into the OPCW? Um, I mean. It's, 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're looking at, okay, hey, what, what is the impact of our work and so on, but bigger question is like, okay, Russia are, uh, or China are like uh, 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 obstructing uh, independent fact-finding missions or stuff like that. I mean, we can see it, we can see it with Israel doing it, US doing it, right? So, I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess um, it's a good question, but I don't, yeah, I don't really know what 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 like we could have a very long discussion about it, but um, I guess I'll just for now just stick to uh, to finding the facts because I mean we still need to continue doing that, right? Because saying okay, because like sure it may not have uh, consequences, right? What you're saying is like okay, hey, there's a chemical attack and there's like basically zero consequences for it. Uh, in the case of Duma, of course, it was not the case, but um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't investigate the facts anymore. Like, no, I agree completely. Don't stop doing what you're doing, but we've got to be careful in jumping to conclusions that that's going to transform international action about um, uh, Ill illegal activities, proliferation and war crimes. Yes, and I think, uh, I think we've heard these sorts of conversations in the other webinars, and I think there's also a sense that it's maybe not clear everything that open source research findings can do yet. Uh, but they are, uh, as, as, as people have said, the transparency in and of itself is, is really useful and interesting and valuable in different dimensions. And even though we might not know everything that might be possible in, in terms of how things could feed into international processes, there are the, nevertheless 
some very clear cases where open source research findings have made a difference. Uh, I think in research conversations with people, there's been several examples of people being uh, in court charged with crimes they have clearly committed on the basis of open source research. So, so things, there are consequences that can come out of this. It's difficult. <laughs> it's not straightforward, um, but, but things uh, happen. Um, so uh, uh, there are two minutes left and I've got some more questions. I know Christian has to go. Please, anybody go that needs to, and I'll see if we can get through um, any of these uh, questions. Um, one more comment from Christina, uh, Paul, that she that she made just before she had to uh, uh, head off. Um, she said that similar work in the nuclear side does get fed into the IAEA and cited by government uh, in cases where private intelligence can't be used. So, so things that it is being used, I totally get what your point would be is that is maybe being invoked, but it's not being heard because there are ways of closing down conversations around it but but it is it is getting to uh different places we've also had some questions following on about uh how to protect practitioners and and how to um how to look out for the people that are doing it and uh there was a there was a comment about there may be lessons to be learned from work on drone strikes uh and uh uh and i think that's a really interesting question to explore so I am actually going to stop the questions now because uh, we are out of time. Um, but as always, I'm sure we could have gone longer uh, in, in, in all of this. Um, uh, it's been really, really interesting and has given me even more to think about than I, than I generally have at the end of these webinars. A video is so fascinating to hear about delete disease collection. I'd have loved to go further with you about the instability of search terms and, and how, how Twitter may be not a particularly uh, satisfyingly uh, um, objective uh, 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 data source to, to research. But that's for another time. Thank you very much, Christian. That was fantastic to see how this is being used by journalists. Um, I wonder, uh, it feels very much as though this this field can only get bigger. You know that this, this is this is the start. Uh, so it would be very interesting to think more about that uh, as we go. But thank you to all the speakers. Gary and Christina were also fantastic. Thank you to, for the questions and for everybody for coming. And I hope very much we'll see you next time. The next webinar is on the 18th of November. We were scheduling it for the 4th of November, but we realised there was a very big event the day before. So we've changed it to the 18th of November. And on that day, we've got Melissa Hannam from the Open Nuclear Network and uh, Hans Christensen um, from the Federation of American Scientists and Alan Hill from Ridgeway. So it's going to be another very interesting one to come to. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. <laughs>